Well, good morning, and let's uh, turn our Bibles back to Colossians 3. I'm going to continue just for the next few weeks or so, Lord willing. Um, actually, today, um, continuing to talk about uh, the risen life according to uh, Colossians chapter 3. And last time we looked at this text, we were looking at the comparison to the old life versus the new life. And the old life not only deals um, with what we would call, what some people call important sins or great sins, or they categorize different sins. I don't know why they do it. Sin is sin. Um, where we talked about uh, the need to kill these sins that are in our bodies, uh, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake, verse 6, uh, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, um, that clearly states that those who are or are lost live in these things, and the result of that is they're going to experience the wrath of God. And then that's not just present wrath, but it's future wrath that I think the context here is. Um, the terminology children of disobedience always in Scripture speaks of unbelievers. It never refers to believers in any context of the New Testament, or any Testament for that matter. And he says in verse 7, in the which ye also walked sometime when you lived in them. He's saying these are behaviors that need to be done away with because they are behaviors of the past sinful, unsaved life. We don't need to be doing this kind of stuff. But then he says something in verse 8, which is astonishing because believers sometimes don't think these list of sins that go along with the others should be in that category, but they are, and they are also uh, sins of the old life. And that is anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Verse 9, lying is another characteristic of the old unsaved life. And Paul is saying these things are to be killed in the believer's life. These things are to be done. When you kill something, you kill it. And it's supposed to be done. And he uses as a proof of that, lie not one to another, verse 9, seeing that ye have put off the old man, with his deed. So all of what we just talked about are all part of the old man, the old corrupt person, the, the unsaved person, and these are the deeds of the old man. So this is something that Paul also said in, in Ephesians 5. I'm not going to turn there. But the old man is gone. So look at verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So there is a new man. The old man is to be dead. The old man is dead. And we should be living in those characteristics that characterize the former lifestyle in which we live. We don't live that way anymore. We don't live according to the old man. We don't because the old man is dead. There's no Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde in a believer. The old man is dead. Okay. A death happened at salvation. I don't know why this is a hard concept for people to understand. But until you understand it, you're never really going to live the way that you should. So we are to put on the new man. We are to be like Christ. The simple, as I can make it as simple in verse 10, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, the simple term would be to live just like Christ. Okay? Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So instead of the old life and the old distinctions and the old man and the old deeds, Paul said, you now live as a new man to be made in the image of Christ. And because of that, verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God. You're the elect of God. That's a whole new sermon. It's a whole new series. As I said last time, when you talk about the election of God, and it's a great truth. Thank God. God elects his own. And thank God I'm one of them. I don't have time to worry about why he didn't elect somebody else. The issue for me and you and everyone else is to proclaim the gospel. And Paul made it clear in his epistle to Timothy that Paul preaches for the sake of the elect. You know, I remember when we did Nightlight, there was some young man that came on the air and he started ranting and raving about election and predestination and blah, blah, blah. And then he started trying to in my mind, blame God for the whole process of election being unfair and that if we really did 
believe what, what Paul wrote, then we wouldn't have to go ahead and preach the gospel. So I quoted to him what Paul said about the elect. He says, I do all things for the sake of the elect, that basically they would come to salvation through Christ. And I heard this silence. I thought maybe there was a glitch in the system. I said, hello, hello. The lights finally came on in his head. That ours is not to try to figure out who the elect are. Ours is to proclaim the gospel and the elect will follow. The beauty is we're elect. See, I'm already deviating going off into that sermon. But as the elect of God, and that's significant because we're elected of God. We're elected to live a certain way that God has for those whom he has chosen. In fact, if you look at the words holy, uh, the word holy signifies an election, a separation, a choosing of one thing devoted to God, and it becomes this way to God. So we are elect, and the first thing in our election is holiness. And that's a choosing um, from that which is common and made it uncommon. So we're the elect of God. I mean, that's a great truth. That's a wonderful truth. Holy and beloved. The word love means love, of, beloved means love of God. So we are chosen by God and we are loved by God. People say, I just don't feel love and blah. You know what? Open your Bible, believe what God says. There shouldn't be any problem about love if you really understand what God says. Because he says that you are chosen by God, that's holy, and loved of God, that's the word beloved. You're loved of God. And as such, instead of being malice and hateful and envious, he said we should have bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. We dealt with these already. Uh, verse 13, we begin there. So let's go back to that, forbearing one another and, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Now, whatever, and I'm just going to be broad with this right now. I, I've dealt with it specifically, but I want to be broad with this. Whatever the quarrel is, whatever the issue is, okay, whatever the strife or quarreling or dissension may be, the issue is forgiveness. The, the goal of rectifying, the goal of ending this is forgiveness. If someone does something against you, the end goal is forgiveness. And that means both parties must work towards that end. I mean, this isn't optional. I think you have a lot of so-called churches where you have a lot of people who have a lot of issues with forgiveness and they just sit in church and they think they're okay, but they've never really rectify quarrels and issues with each other and they just sit around and they just go on months years you know with this bitterness and cantankerousness about them but the goal is for forgiveness so the, the if you have a grievance if someone has a grievance against you and you with them the express purpose of all this instruction is peace within the body building up the body to walk like christ and that is to forgive and Christ being the standard of that. Now, again, as I said last time, forbearing with one another, and I've heard people say this, and they're wrong. Forbearing with one another does not mean that we excuse and put up with the sinful behavior of believers. We just don't do that. That's not the instruction that Paul gave. And anyone that gives you the impression that that's what it means does not know what he or she is talking about. That is not what the Bible teaches. And we need to really stop doing that. The end goal of the church uh, collective is holiness. The end goal of the church individual is holiness. Whether you're talking to collective body or individual believers, the end goal is holiness. So the idea that we would excuse sin is would be a contradiction of what he's already written us. Putting on a new garment means killing sin. So how could he be talking about, well, if anyone's got a sin, just put up with it. When the whole context prior to that is killing sin on the individual and collective level. So let's learn to, again, to read the context of the passage. All right. Again, that would be a direct contradiction of what he's already said as far as putting on a new garment is concerned and a direct contradiction of an abundance of scripture of instructions to believers concerning how to handle unrepentant sinning believers. So we need to know that as well. There are some professing believers, frankly, they need to... I guess take some serious inventory how they uh, conduct themselves among other believers. Um, it could be a matter of 
a new convert. Sometimes it's, it's difficult, I must admit, as a new convert. And I think every one of us who are older converts would have to admit that as new believers, we, we really didn't know a lot of things. So there was always a tendency to be, you know, maybe a little prideful if we had a passage of scripture open up to us and we were, you know, blazing new trails of trying to teach these old people. And, and then you had the old people that didn't want to hear anything about young people because they thought we we're all young and didn't respect them and blah, blah, blah. And I grew up in that environment when I became a believer. And there was a lot of, I guess, uh, cantankerous behavior amongst young and old. And I believe, I frankly blame the pastors for a lot of it because they never really established a system in the church where the older people were shown the kind of, well, let's put it this way, the respect if they deserved it by by means of living in the way that Paul talked about in Titus chapters 1 and 2, where they would be an example to the young people. And that the young people needed to submit to the examples that were given to them in the church, you know, if they were in line with scripture. So the pastor didn't teach and set up and establish an environment where those two entities, we have the older people and the younger people were walking in, in unison together, so the church stayed divided. So then everything now you see is, and you see the same garbage now, and even far worse than it was when, in the 70s when I became a believer, far worse than it is now. I mean, you have whole segments of, of so-called churches which are devoted to young people, and then they have this non-biblical title of youth pastor who basically is another person like them because they think they can relate to them, which makes no sense in Christ because we're one in Christ. But I guess your Bible doesn't, you know, need to be consulted if you have an, 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 an open-ended scripture where everything you do is of the Lord and none of it really matches with the Bible. So you have to kind of get rid of the Bible so you can do your thing. So you have all these groups and now you have groups that are trying to look as cutting edge worldly and carnally as possible which makes them worldly and carnally as possible because that's what they are and that's supposed to attract the youth and basically it attracts the youth of the fake church members who think they're believers and they then they take this same young thing and and they turn into something that's supposedly a ministry and they have this all over the place and so old people that just wait for them to die so that they can just continue to make this monstrosity they created from the Lord. But the Bible doesn't teach any of that. It doesn't teach the attitude on the flip side, which you have a bunch of old people who are just stuck and stupid and stale, and they're going to stay that way. And young people are going to hell in, in a wicker basket, and they're content to let them go. In the church, you have the older people are the examples examples of godliness whether it's the husbands or the wives the older women the older men they're all to be examples of godliness and the young people seeing those examples of godliness are to submit themselves to that so that the church is united the church grows together everyone not not feels a sense of importance but it is important because it's fulfilling the plan of god that's the simple plan of god but people have thrown their bibles away and they have done exactly what they wanted to do. So the Bible becomes a proof text to what they said the Lord wants them to do, even though what they're doing, claiming the Lord said it and does it, has nothing to do with that book. Because these people, these people don't believe in closed revelations. So they just keep making stuff up as they go along. And the Lord leads them and guides them and tells them and to do all kinds of ridiculous things. Why would God tell you to do something that contradicts his revealed word. That makes no sense at all. And so we, you know, we talk about the charismatic movement, but these things are in Protestantism too. They're in all kinds of my environment was Baptist churches. They're they're in, in all different kinds of evangelical churches now. The whole the whole head is sick, the prophet said of Israel. The whole head is sick. And everyone's doing what they want to do. And they're ignoring what God says. And his plan is so simple. It's right there. And so you got whole churches divided on a corporate level. And they're divided on a personal level. And no one's doing anything to rectify anything. And then forgiveness becomes this big gigantic thing that has to be done. And Just do it. Just do it. That's <laughs> no big giant brouhaha that has to be made about it. Just do it. 
if you care about Christ and wanting to make sure that the body is one and you care about the will of God, you do the thing. That's all you have to do. My goodness, why do we waste our time? You know, we do all this stuff because we don't want to give up our flesh. And some people, they just don't know how to conduct themselves. Well, if they're new, get them under people who are spiritually strong, who are the spiritually strong, and then help them to grow. I think about Romans where Paul said, you know, you are strong, bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please yourself. And that'd be a perfect fitting environment for this. Those who are strong in the Lord, you have to put up with the infirmities, with the, with the failings of the weak because they're weak and they don't know. And when you help them to know, and when you build them up, then they grow. Simple. Simple. For bring one another, verse 13 again, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, and here's the, here's the purpose clause, here's the reason, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. So Christ is the standard of forgiveness by which all believers are to forgive one another. Hmm. How many of your sins did Christ forgive? Every last one of them. Even the ones that haven't been done yet. They're all forgiven. And that's amazing truth in and of itself. All of our sins are forgiven. That's the greater. Okay, right? All of our all listen, that's the greater. All of our sins are forgiven. Since Christ forgave multitudes of wickedness when we turn to him, how much more should we then forgive other believers who come to us for forgiveness of our offenses? Okay, so someone offends us, and they come to us. You know, the Spirit of God is dealing with their hearts. He's pricked their hearts. He's convicted their hearts. And then they recognize, you know what, I was wrong, and, you know... I need to turn and, and deal with this brother or sister, come back and, and, and confess. That's another whole deal. You know, people act like, well, if I offended you, you know you did, and you just did again by lying. The Spirit of God didn't tell you to go there and do the general term, the cover-up. The Spirit of God told you to go to that person. He led you to go to that person and confess. You know why I said that's of the Lord? Because it's biblical. And that's what he would do if he led you. You go back to that person and you would ask their forgiveness. You don't say, if I, if I offended you, you know you did. Then just, just confess. That's it. And our response is to forgive. Period. As Christ forgave us. I want to make this public statement. I've made it before and I'll make it again because it's necessary. There has never been a single person that has offended me, and I've been offended a lot in my Christian life as a pastor and as an individual, but there has never been a single person that has genuinely come back and has repented. I've, I've withheld forgiveness. And there never will be. Never will be. It has never happened, and it will never be. If a person comes back and they do things the right way, my door and heart is always open. Why? Because Christ forgave me. And so I must and desire to forgive you. All you got to do is do what God says. And the door is open. And it has happened to people that have ought against me for double digit years. And yet when they came back, they were shocked. They were forgiven. I said, well, I, how are you shocked? I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Christ, a worshiper of the Almighty. I, I forgive you and not only have to by obligation, but because I'm a new man, I want to do it. You see, when you're, when you're the old man, you don't want to forgive. The old man does not want to forgive. That's part of that malice we talked about. Holding on to sins, holding on to wrongs. When you're a new man, you forgive. Because you've experienced this cleansing, this great work of being forgiven. But that's a cleansing work. I don't know how many people I've heard say, and I've said it. And it's amazing we say it because there's, there's something about this. The second I was saved, it felt like the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. I must have heard that hundreds of times as a believer. The moment I was saved, I felt like the, the burden, the weight of sin. I probably grew a half inch. 
it's I just straightened up. Something it just felt like the whole world of sin was lifted off my shoulder. I've heard hundreds of people say that. It's incredible that when you're clean and you know it, oh, you want that for others. Christ forgave us freely without qualifiers. How much the more should we forgive others who offend us, who have suffered infinitely less than he? We should be more than willing to forgive. When the person does the right thing, see, I want to make that emphasis. If there's no repentance, if there's no brokenness, if there's no confession of sin, well, until that happens, keep keep stepping. But once that, that other person comes to conviction and need of forgiveness, yeah, forgive them, period. So in this short study of ours, we have seen that our completeness in Christ positionally affects our practice on earth. So we know belief affects behavior. We're instructed to put off the old garment, put on the new, which happened at salvation. But Paul wanted his readers to know that it happened in their practice as well, and that it needed to be a continual practice for the believer. And look at verse 14. I mean, you look at the greatness of verse 13. You know, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And that's a powerful statement. But then he follows with this in verse 14. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness, of perfectness. Above all these things. Wow. The words above all these things may or may not refer to that which is over something as a rank, the context and grammar determines that the word could mean in addition to something. In other words, in addition to these, in addition to all these that he just mentioned. That's what's so beautiful about study. You don't, you don't miss things up. So it could be in addition to these things. Okay, now some also believe that it could mean above as of greater in this sense. Without love... Without God's love, it's impossible to have any of these characteristics of the new man manifest in anyone's life. God's love, regardless of what you believe it to be in this verse, whether it's something over something or it could mean in addition to something, either way, the point is this, even if it meant either one or both. Uh, without God's love, it's impossible to have any of the characteristics of the new man. So God's love, therefore, is absolutely essential uh, for the other characteristics to exist. Therefore, you must be saved. See, this can only happen to save people. This can only happen to save people. And if we are really walking in the Spirit like we like to tell everybody we are, and we, we say it with a lot of swagger and pride about us, which the Spirit of God would never give you either one of those, then we would be quick to do God's will. See, if I'm going to boast about being in the Spirit, then I should be boasting about doing the will of God. And remember, the work of the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit does not speak of himself, Jesus says. So I hear a lot of Holy Ghost this and Holy Ghost that. Well, the fact is that the Holy Spirit's ministry is to finish or continue, I should say, the work that Christ began on earth. So he doesn't have an independent work apart from Christ. So the Holy Spirit's role in ministry is to do exactly that, to fulfill and to finish the work which Christ began on earth. So you don't ignore Christ because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's all connected into the new man. That's all connected into the new life. He doesn't have independent work. That's why you hear all this stuff, this super duper crazy emphasis on the Holy Spirit. And you start to noticing two distinct things that are troubling. First of all, an elimination of the written word. Number two, the elimination of the biblical Christ. You have to. Yep, those have to go. God's love is absolutely essential for the other characteristics to exist. The love of God is described as the bond of perfectness. That which binds all these characteristics of the new man together is God's love. All of it. All of it. It is the bond of perfectness, the completeness of a process. Now, how is it in that environment we can't see growth and forgiveness and love? How is that possible? That's why it's absolutely essential 
that we have people that are biblically trained and taught in the written revelation of God because that's where our answers are. It's there in the word. And I might say only in the word. Love described in verse 10 is stated as fulfilling. In fact, let's go to Romans. Uh, let's go to Romans, uh, let's see, 13 for a moment here. Romans 13, 8 through 10. Romans 13, make sure I get it. Look what it says here. Romans 13, 8 through 10. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfilling of the law. Love is stated in that verse, verse 10, as the fulfilling of the law. Love is the completeness. It is a fulfillment. So Paul talked about it both in Romans. He talked about it here. Also in Colossians, it is the completion of a process. The work of Christ is a completed process in the church. It is not a process that has a beginning but no continuance. It's a process that begins and continues and goes on. It, it's unceasing. That's what makes this such a wonderful work, a great work. No greater quality of a believer could ever be manifest than God's love. It is to be the the cement, as it were, that holds all believers together. Without it, we are wasting our time as individual believers and as a church. And I dare say love is not coming to a church and sitting next to people and grinning and cheesing and smiling. That's not love at all. Or if you agree with me on my four or five different religious views, or if we have a view that you know, believes in conservatism as opposed to in damnable, you know, stinking, demonic-filled liberals. As if that's not a problem within the so-called conservative ranks in, in politics, or in the church for that matter. No, it's to understand the love of God and the plan of God and the will of God according to the scriptures from God and then to live in it and to be cemented together, to have a completed work that the Spirit of God and God the Father and the Son may be glorified through Christ. That's how we do things. That's how we're supposed to do things. And everything else is wrong. And there are so-called churches filled to the raptors with people, and they are completely wrong. They do not manifest these things. Let love be without pretense, without a display of insincere behavior, without artificial behavior, Adopted to impress others. That's Romans 12. Let's look at Romans 12, 9. If I'm not mistaken, Paul. I don't need to be mistaken. Just read what he said. There you go. Paul said, let love be without dissimulation. That's what the word dissimulation means. Pretense. It means a display of insincere behavior with, you know, people, oh, I love you. No, no, you don't. There are a lot of people that talk love. You know, I just keep thinking, all we need is love. Because that's all they seem to think. All we need is love. Love. Love is all we need. And they, that's that should be their theme song. Forget their life verse. That should be their theme song. But they don't understand what love are you referring to. If it's human love, and most of it is, or the love of emotion, the love of feeling, God's love loves the truth. That's what 1 Corinthians says, chapter 13. Love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. If there's no truth, what love are you talking about? It doesn't even matter. You can't have genuine godly love and just dismiss truth. That's stupid. It all goes together. It is a supernatural love from God, not emotional Human feelings, most often and incorrectly called love. Turn to Romans 5, verses 3 through 5. Romans 5, verses 3 through 5. And not only so, you look at this. Okay, and not, and not only so, but we 
glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation produces patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, listen, by the Holy Ghost, who is given unto us. It's not about some emotional thing. Turn to Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 22. It's not some emotional thing. But the fruit of the Spirit is, first word is love, etc. So all these things are necessary, and all these things are a work of the Spirit of God. This is what we call love. It's a work of God. It's a work of the Spirit of God. We are to be firmly steadfast in our love because it is the only way that we are able to communicate our love to one another and the only way that we can build up each other spiritually. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. So when I think about love, I think about what the Bible calls love. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit, by his spirit in the inner man. You, you see all the time this great work of the spirit. That Christ, or so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's a powerful statement. When you talk about love, I'm not talking about some goofy emotion. And when I hear people talk about it nine times out of nine, that's what they're talking about. Oh, we just need to love everyone to Jesus. That is a statement nowhere taught in Scripture. I, I, I don't even know what that means. That means nothing. What does that mean? That's one of those cliches I hear all the time, especially from Calvary Chapel folk. We just need to love people to Jesus. What does that translate into from a biblical sense? What does that mean? What does that mean? And, and then we find ourselves saying the same mess, but then we ask people to define it. I know what they're saying. Here's what they mean. Harley, you need to stop being, you know, so exacting about the truth because People won't, you know, feel the love of God in you if you if you if you keep being so dogmatic about the truth. Listen, you don't even love a guy like me who's teaching you the truth, and you're commanded to love a guy like me because I'm doing that. So your whole nonsensical assessment of loving people is so bogus, you should drop that foolishness immediately. Your definition of loving people to Jesus means never a conflict. Really? I'm afraid the Bible knows nothing about that. You would just got rid of the entire New Testament. I mean, Christ loved people so much he died for them. I think there's a conflict in that. He loved people so much he let them persecute and beat him and kill him. What does your love do? Does it do anything like that? No. The love of God poured out upon his apostles, and they also suffered many of the same abuses and persecutions that the Lord did. But yours doesn't. You know why? Because you don't know what you're talking about. Your supposed loving people to Jesus means no conflict. Well, I just want them to see Christ in me. You don't look anything like Jesus. And you know it because you do nothing to, to, to emulate the Lord to the degree where they will treat you like they treat him. Wake up out of your fantasy. I'm just going to love everyone to Jesus. Yeah, what you mean is you're going to be a compromise like everybody else. You're going to look like them, talk like them, walk like them, smell like them, and be like them in some fantasy of winning them to Christ about some love. Wake up out of your stupor. This is love, what the Bible says. What you're saying is a bunch of nonsense. Absolute nonsense. What else? The body grows continually in love when the members continue to minister spiritual gifts one to another by love. Are you doing that? No. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. I'm just saying what God said in this word. I really don't care what you say in your fantasy. Because that's what it is. Ephesians 4, 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that we all come in the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, that ye henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. It's time to grow up from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You cannot have love without being built up. You can't be built up without love. It's the fruit of it. You can't. How about 1 Thessalonians 3.1? I'm having Bible. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for you to tell me what it means. I'm just going to love people of Jesus, and I want you to give me some exposition to prove it, rather than your cliche, because I know what you mean. Wherefore, when you could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow labor in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to confirm you concerning your faith. Let's see. Make sure I got the right one myself here. Let me make sure I got the right one. Let me see. I don't have the right one, so I'm not going to. Uh, if you find it for me, let me know. Because I have scholars over here. I can find the stuff. <laughs> Hebrews 13 1. That, but that is sure. Hebrews 13 1. Let brotherly love continue. So again. The, the love among the brethren is non-ceasing. So there's always to be this environment that, that is produced by the Spirit of God where love is always the priority. It's always there. It's always going to be there. Always. We are to be imitators of God. That means we are to walk in love, Christ being the standard. We saw that in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. God teaches believers how to love one another. 1 Thessalonians 4. This is very important, this verse here. 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, verses 10 and 11. God teaches you how to love. I don't need someone to tell me how to do it. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel of sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no, that no man go beyond the fraud of his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness, he therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as concerning brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught by God, or from God, or of God, to love one another. Paul said, I don't have to give you a lesson on how to love each other, because the Spirit of God is in you, does that. Salvation teaches you what love is, and how to love each other. We talk about, listen, you talk that nonsense about loving loving others to Jesus. You don't even love the brethren in your own church. This is madness. Get rid of the cliches and go back to truth. And that's all you got is a bunch of cliches. You don't even love believers in your own church. What are you talking about loving people outside of, you don't even love the ones in the church. How about why don't you do that, that cliche garbage to the ones in your fellowship? Amen. I'm going to tell it because no one else wants to hear it. That's why I'm going to tell it. Love is to be exercised with purity and godliness. Pure heart is a clean heart. 1 Peter 1, verses 22 through 23. That's why we're going to keep talking the truth. You, keep, you can keep all your cliches. I'm going to go with the truth. Thank you. Seeing that ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth of the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, <clears throat> grammatically, having been born again. You can't love anybody with anything if you're not born again. And we already dealt with that passage extensively in this series, so I'm not going to go back over it again. And love is the foundation by which all church ministries have any meaning at all. 1 Corinthians 13. 
So it behooves us when you talk about love that you talk about it from the standpoint of Scripture. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profit me nothing. So I say nothing, I am nothing, and I do nothing without love. So when you talk about love, talk about it from the Bible. Talk about it from an, from an extensive study in the Word of God, an understanding of what God says. Not some cliché nonsense, which really doesn't do anything for anybody, except it deceives people to believe they're doing something that they're not. And all this feeling, and you got to have feelings, and feel, all this is garbage. Love is the work of the Holy Spirit. If that's not operating your love, you can talk about all this love all you want, but it's not from God. Back to Colossians 3. <clears throat> and above all these things, put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to do which you're also called in one body and be thankful. Wow. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, individually and collectively. The peace of God is that which brings reconciliation. The word rule means umpire, to arbitrate or to decide. It is to be the peace of God that is to decide all matters of the hearts of the believers. I, I, you know what? Let me take some a sip of this cold coffee here for a second. It's the peace of God, the love of God, the rule of God. The desire of Paul is to have peace ever growing in the church. That's the desire of Scripture. The love of God is to be the goal that we are to achieve. The peace of God will be the result of that goal. See how simple this all is? And we mess everything up. Because we got all our schemes and plans and junk. And they're not working. Because it's not designed to work. Because they're not from the Lord. Simple reading like this ought to just shut down a whole bunch of this junk. But it won't. Because we are content in our little game. We got a little, our little group of knuckleheads who believe and share the same lie and the foolishness and we all agree because we all you know everyone's got be, everybody can't be wrong a whole lot of everybody's are wrong and everybody's wrong is not doing this god's way and we're just content to be hidden in the crowd okay matters that are internal must not be allowed to upset or to destroy the balance of peace in the congregation and I want you to notice I never implied and never have and never will that we ought to have peace at any cost. That's crazy. That, that's crazy. And a lot of people believe that, but they're believing a lie. It is God's love that is to direct the peace. Love for God first, which in turn will properly lead God's professed people to love each other. You cannot have that order twisted. Sin is not love. Sin does not produce peace. Sin is not to be tolerated in the body, even if it means expulsion of an unrepentant individual or individuals from the body for the body's sake. You keep that door unlocked. If they don't want to repent, show them the door. You have to keep that body pure. It has to be. Love of God must dominate all areas of church life, but it is God's love, that holy love, that builds up and does not tolerate sinful behavior as we have already seen in this epistle. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which ye are also called. Our calling into the body of Christ calls us to keep peace within the body. And there are plenty of scriptures. I'm just going to let you, I'll read the scriptures off to you. You study them in your time. And just see for yourself what the Bible says. Romans 14, 19. 1 Corinthians 14.33 2 Corinthians 13.11 Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 3 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 12 through 13 2 Timothy 2.22 And the verse in 2 Timothy goes right back to what I said a few moments ago about peace in the church body arising out of moral and spiritual purity. There can be no peace, no true peace, unless there is godliness in that church. 
You've got to keep the place pure. And last reference is 1 Peter 3, verses 10 and 11. Again, righteousness is associated with true peace and operation in the church body. So let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which you are called into one body and be thankful. This refers to being thankful to God. In the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, the word means gratefulness which brings honor to a husband. That's interesting. The word refers to being thankful to God in the New Testament. That's amazing. Be thankful. The one characteristic that they were done of the believer ought to be thankfulness. And friends, if you're going to have a church like this, <laughs> the environment would be fantastic gratitude and thankfulness. Amen. I mean, I, it's amazing to me how the Bible is so crystal clear. It's so crystal clear. This is everything the churches keep saying they want. They try to get it outside of Scripture. And it's like a manufacturing plant. Everyone's got their gimmicks and their tricks and their junk. And they don't work. In fact, what is the work of it? What is the evidence of it? I'm going to tell you again. Uncle Harley going to tell you what the reason is behind all this stuff. Cha-ching. Money and members. That's what it is. Money and members. That's what this is all about. It has nothing to do with the church, nothing to do with righteousness, nothing to do. They tolerate all kinds of junk, all kinds of evil, all kinds of sin. Under the guise of love, that's no love at all. God's perfect plan is written right in the book. His perfect plan for his church is written right in this book. We don't need any gimmicks or plans or schemes of man. They have all failed. I've been saying this for 30 some odd years. It's all failed. And all you got to do is look around you. Now they got new gimmicks. Every time you turn around, there's some stupid gimmick. It's never of God. He had nothing to do with it. Nothing. And the irrelevance of the so-called church that we see in, in many a place, friends, many in this country, is a testament to the fact that God isn't in any of that junk. Not the God of Scripture. Maybe the God of this age. Satan, but certainly not the Lord. And the church needs more than revival. Revival implies repentance. There needs to be some serious repenting going on. And then we're going to see some wonderful things happen. Lord, thank you again for your word today. And we pray that we have heard from you and learned from you, Lord. Learned about you even more and more. May you be glorified, Lord, as we continue to proclaim your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's not be fooled, friends. Let's not be fooled. A lot of things that we're hearing and that we're seeing and that we're, we're being told that these things are of the Lord when they're not. You know, exercise discernment. Don't be fooled by the foolishness. Don't be fooled by the size and all the stupid music, so-called, that has nothing to do with truth. Don't let truth be jettisoned for the sake of some band or bands or whatever. You hold the truth and hold tight to Christ. Wake up. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Wake up, friends. God willing, we'll see you back here at 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And thanks for staying with us and thanks for hopefully learning because, you know, people normally wouldn't come back if, if they weren't learning anything. So hopefully something shared with you that would be a blessing. And tell others about the program. Tell others. If it's a blessing to you, it would be a blessing to others. Let them know what we're doing here at FOTBC. See you tonight, 4 o'clock, Pacific Standard Time, California time. God bless.